Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the books that I read this week. And this looks like a huge pile, all from the library. Um, and it's fairly big, but actually a lot of these are very, very quick reads and the, the, the size of these books belies how quick they actually are um, to read. But a really, really fun week nonetheless, and let's get talking about what some of those are. First up, um, I did a separate video on these, but I read three books by Edouard Louis, um, which were A Woman's Battles and Transformations, uh, The End of Eddie, and Who Killed My Father. And um, as I sort of say in that that separate video on, um, on Edouard Louis, I was really quite entranced by how this how his writing works in terms of exposing so often some of the most difficult and painful parts of his own experiences growing up as a, a working class um young gay man in um sort of rural-ish france um and how that really had a an impact on how he viewed so so much of the world and so um the end of eddie being a more sort of autobiographical novel um that, that details a lot of his sort of childhood and, and into adulthood and then um who killed my father being more of a an angry sort of political um piece of writing that details just the real difficulty he had in his relationship with his father but also how the government decisions and political decisions had a massive impact on his father's quality of life in later life and how he almost essentially blames them then for his father's death um hence the, the title um and then we also have um a woman's battles and transformations which focuses a lot more on the relationship with his mother and his father and his mother's relationship was often quite complicated um as was edouard's relationship with his mother and so this book is, despite being incredibly short and very, very quick to read, goes into some really beautiful details about the tendernesses and small moments between him and his mother um, and how there's this sort of understanding that goes between them um, with him as a sort of young gay man and his mother. Um, but then also there's there are sort of worlds apart that they they are worlds apart at times as well. So really really beautiful beautiful um, books I think, um, and I'm really keen to read more of his work as well. Next up I read Audrey Lord's uh, Zami, a new spelling of my name, a biomythography, um, and this is uh, sort of Audrey Lord's. Um, well, I mean I say memoirs. She's obviously called it a biomythography, um, but it essentially does function often kind of like a, a memoir for her where she talks about discovering who she was um, and kind of particularly her her burgeoning sense of herself, of her sexuality, but also the complications she found as a black woman, a black lesbian um, in the US and particularly the impact that had on various things, so her studies, her writing, her relationships. And um, but I think what's really just beautiful about this book in so, so many ways is the way that she articulates the small details of her um, sexuality and of finding herself that she often overlooks things or doesn't notice things straight away because she kind of assumes that people are interacting with her in a certain way. And she has this string of um, these sort of relationships and crushes, um, some of them ending really quite tragically, um, in one case, the, the death of one of her partners. Um, and when she is in those moments of pure love or, or, or kind of really early into this sort of journey of it, there's such an excitement that bubbles through this book of just the, the sheer beauty of that moment and the tenderness and the vulnerability that goes with that. Um, but I think also so many moments in this book that are, um, where you can almost feel her holding back some of the anger that she could unleash in this book. Um, but instead it's a very thoughtful and very, um, very clever book, um, I think in many, many ways in terms of talking about her relationships. I will admit, I, I kind of, I, I was expecting to fully, fully love this and, you know, I still, it still was a great four star read for me and I still really enjoyed it. I think for some reason, I, I don't know why, I think part of me thought, maybe because I've been on a bit of a memoir spree recently that I would sort of, um, it was sort of slot within that, but it's still a really, really interesting book. And, um, especially Audrey Lord, I think I've got another book of hers somewhere in the background there. Um, just a, a writer who I keep on meaning to read even more of because I just, um, from a set of essays I read of hers, she's such a, a brilliant observer of everything around her. And I think in this book, you almost learn a little bit of why that is as well, that she grew up quite sort of physically short sighted. You know, she often couldn't see a lot of things. And so, she was quite used to being left in the background and therefore she often came became even better at observing the situations around her for survival. 
Next up, courtesy of the wonderful Anne Novella um, here on Booktube, um, I read uh, Lika Marsman's um, The Opposite of a Person, translated by Sophie Collins. And um, I, I, Anne Novella loved this and um, sold it to me on just how passionate she was about this. And I see it. <laughs> I totally get it. I, I found this really enjoyable. It's, it's at times an incredibly playful and experimental book. Um, in just really interesting ways and so it, it kind of it, it sort of blurs lines often between fiction and non-fiction where there will be these little inserts of facts or things that sound like they're from essays complementing a very rich fictional world going on in this as well so the background of this is that um, we have a young woman Ida who is working um, in climate science and she is trying to convince people around her of impending climate change and climate doom in many ways and she um, is often not believed um, but also she is often very very much struggling to have her voice be heard in many situations not just at work but in her personal life as well and what sort of transpires is this this story merges between these sort of fictional worlds and this sort of very um, very realistic sort of scientific thing that's going on and then it, sort of about the midpoint really of this book it almost breaks this sort of mold and starts to really pick up speed and change and transform and I found that really just incredible I mean I was already enjoying it I already thought that her witty asides and little put downs were incredibly well observed and very very well done and I think also hats off to the translator for making those feel authentically English <laughs> um a lot lots of the little asides felt I actually a couple of times had to check that this was a translated work um, because it read so much like a book that a British person would have written at times um, because the, the nuance of it was so there um, and I just really enjoyed where this then took me. Um, it builds towards this really incredible crescendo at the end that I don't want to give away um, but it almost starts being that language and words start breaking away and not not doing what they need to or you know even at one point in the page has a couple of words just dotted around um, and it really builds to this pace that I think is is so so brilliant and I really really loved it so thank you Anne um, and also please do check Anne out on, on booktube she's wonderful um, but yes really really beautiful beautiful book. After that, I read uh, a graphic novel called Alison by Lizzie Stewart, and I kept on seeing this online for ages and really, really wanted to check it out. Um, and essentially, it's the story of uh, an artist, a sort of young, a young artist, Alison, um, who um, leaves a marriage um, that she, you know, she gets married, I think, at like 20, 19 or 20 or something like that. And she leaves this, this um, marriage to go and be uh, with an artist that she meets at a, an art class um, and she moves to London from uh, sort of being in a rur fairly rural area and it's such a kind of new experience for her everything's brand new there's uh, things are changing constantly and she's already quite this sort of quiet mousy sort of character and finds it really difficult to understand this world um, but actually slowly comes into herself as an artist um this this husband you know this new partner that she she meets when she moves uh to london you know uh, who she moves to london for at first their relationship seems quite nice and exciting but then she suddenly comes to realize that she was essentially a project for him or she was a muse and she's very easily replaceable and so that's when she really starts to come into her own in terms of her art realizing that he wasn't gonna do much more to you know to promote her art or to support her and so she has to do it by herself and she becomes at the end of this book in quite a touching way we sort of learn where she is now and the, there's a you know a sort of retrospective of her works being put on and she's this artist who's arrived in her own right um and also telling the story of an artist in a graphic novel just makes so much sense because you just get sheer beauty on so many pages we get to see early sketches of her work um, we get to see these final pieces and there's something so profound about the way it all comes together and i just really loved this i just thought it was so stunning and, and just a really enjoyable enjoyable read um and again because it's a graphic novel doesn't often take too too long but um i was fully immersed in this world for for a while um, and and just loved loved everywhere it took me 
Next, I read a set of essays that I kept on seeing online called Whatever Happened to Queer Happiness by Kevin Brazil. Um, and this looks a lot at various moments of um, queer culture and queer joy, especially through various lenses, through art, through music, um, through books and through various other things. And so we kind of get this, this sense of a, a sort of history of what does it look like to be queer now? What has that looked like, to, looked like historically? And what's the kind of current mood of, um, of the nation when we talk about queer histories and lives and various other things? So, for example, there are passages that talk about um, the the joy of losing yourself in a club and, you know, just being one with the music and all of that, that sort of thing. But then also how so often, you know, some of the big um, popular blockbuster films or books or what have you um, to do with LGBTQ people um, very often um, focus on a tragic story, you know, everybody dies or it's an unrequited love story or what have, have you. And very rarely do we fully get to see queer characters just living a very happy and enjoyable life. Um, and obviously this book does acknowledge that a big reason behind that is queer phobia, <laughs> you know, and given what we've just seen happen in the US, um, in, um, in I think Club Q, I believe it was called, the, the shooting that happened there, I think, you know, it's very clear that, um, even the happiest, safest queer space can still feel like it's massively under threat at any time. And many people's reaction to that abhorrent shooting has been to point out that, you know, we always are a little bit looking over our shoulders. And moments like that are obviously, you know, awful and make this even worse, this feeling that we can't even, even the places that are sort of quote unquote ours, still don't fully feel like we're safe in. Um, so the, this this essay collection goes into a lot of what it can feel, you know, the sort of slightly unstable feeling of of being queer and not fully knowing where you are and how you can be safe. But it also does some really incredible things, I think, um, to talk about the joy, uh, the joys of those moments. And last but not least, um, we have The Woman Who Was Not There by Joelle Taylor. Um, so I loved, loved, I've loved um, her poetry collection Kunto and Othered Poems, um, which won the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Polari Prize and is just also generally wonderful. Um, and so I thought I'd check out more of her poetry. And The Woman Who Was Not There is a bit more of a testament in many ways to um, various communities that are marginalised and are sort of fighting to be present and be at the table. So this book looks a lot, for example, at state violence and, um, for example, um, people being um, arrested or targeted. It looks a lot at, for example, um, like refugee and migrant women. It looks at quite a lot of different people and I think that's in many ways the collection's strength is sort of focusing on so many different bits although it does sometimes mean it's a little bit harder to have as a coherent whole um, for the collection I think but still you know all of Joelle Taylor's incredible gifts are on show here of just her ability to write so forcefully and powerfully um, and so tenderly often about um, incredibly difficult complex uh, topics so yeah really really um, recommend just reading Joel Taylor anyway um, particularly Kanto which I think is fantastic um, but this book I also did really enjoy and that's been those have been all the books I read this uh, this week and again it seems like a lot but these are many of them very short um, or very very quick reads I don't know why I'm justifying that but you know these are great books regardless, so please do check them out. Um, I've been Bob, uh, showing, showing you the books that I read this week. Um, I hope you're all doing really, really well as we get closer and closer to the Christmas uh, season. Um, and I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to a bit of time to just fully switch off. I'm still going to be doing videos and everything, but, uh, you know, we're kind of rapidly getting to that point. Um, and also soon I will start sort of finally trying to choose my favourite books of the year. Last year there was some very, very late um, late entrance to that list where I think two of the books on my top books of the, of, of the year were ones that I'd read about two weeks before I did it. So I'm still very optimistic that I could still find a lot of them, particularly as, um, as you'll have seen, I did, a, you know, I'm sort of doing the in December thing um, of reading lots of indie books that I've been putting off reading for most of the year. And I'm fairly sure a couple of them will find their way onto 
um, onto that list because they sound fantastic. Um, anyway, I've been Bother Booker talking about my books this week. I hope you've had a fantastic week. I hope you're keeping safe and well in this very busy period, I think, for everybody. And uh, take care and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.